Heartline family, how are we doing this morning? Oh, how are we doing this morning? Wow, okay, all right. There's not very many of us in here, but if you're joining us online, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here in person. Would you stand as we begin this morning? I just felt the Lord challenge my heart this week and over the past few months even to just believe him that he is who he says he is. And we look back at, you know, the scriptures and we see all these amazing things that the Lord has done, all the miracles that he's worked and um, just the mighty power that he has. And we read these stories. And I think sometimes we think they're just stories. They're dead, they're just written in the book. But those things can still happen today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so we can trust that he is the same, that he can do those things again, and he will. And so this morning, we're going to sing about the might and the power of our God. In this song specifically, it struck my heart this week. It says, there's no soul that you can't save. And I began to think about this season of life that I'm in. I've never known so many people that don't know Jesus. And it breaks my heart because they don't know the hope of the gospel. And so for us this morning, know that you might be the only person in your context that is representing Jesus for somebody else that doesn't know him. And so this morning, I just hope that we can can proclaim this message that God is able to save souls. He's able to bring hope to hopeless situations, whether you are anxious or depressed, he can bring peace and hope and comfort. He can restore marriages. He can do it because he is God and he is powerful. And so this morning, would you just join us as we begin to worship and to focus in on who God is, what he can do, because he will do it again. Amen? Amen. Let's worship. Come 
morning church we get to learn a new song and I'm so excited about it because just as I was saying earlier you might be the only person that someone who doesn't know Jesus experiences Jesus through you you might be that person and so this morning we're gonna learn this new song just about asking the Holy Spirit to rest on us in a new way and to rest in us in a new way and to empower us to be who he has created us to be in the context where we are, to serve and to give and to share the gospel and to do all of these things that we on our own cannot do. And so this is really just a prayer, just asking Holy Spirit, would you come and would you do what you want to do in my life because you are what I want. So this is how it goes. This is the chorus. So come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here. It's a lot of words. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's a lot of words. <laughs> but I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Let's sing it together. Come down. So calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room.
the Spirit. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us, yeah. as we learn this new part.
Lord, come and fill us. It's only by your spirit, only by your power that we're able to go out and impact the world for your kingdom, Lord. So would you do it through us? us to miss that truth, our relation to Jesus Christ, 
a life of surrender. So would you just let these words sink in as we sing them again? How about to idols? I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're God a praise offering. We can do a little bit better than that, can't we really? I mean, come on. There we go. There we go. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we, uh, we pause right now, Lord. We say you are the king. You are Lord. You are God over everything. And Lord, we are created for one and only purpose, and that is to praise you and to magnify your name. And that's what we're doing here this morning, Lord. We gather as a community of believers because we don't get to do this alone. We get to do this with a community of believers. And we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, that we get to magnify your name, not just on Sundays, but Monday through Saturday as well. We get to magnify your name in our workplace, Lord, and talking to a coworker who doesn't even know you, Lord. And, and we introduce you to them. We magnify your name. We magnify your name, Lord, with our toddlers and our kids, Lord, and it's a difficult situation, and we don't really have all the answers on that, but, Lord, we seek you, and we magnify your name through that. We magnify your name even this morning, Lord, as maybe some of us had come into this place, and we didn't have electricity this morning, or maybe a tree fell in our house, or maybe we got water in the basement. Lord, those are just circumstances, but still, we pause and we say, you are King, you are Lord, and we magnify your name this morning, regardless of the circumstance, because you are worthy of praise. We thank you again for just allowing us the privilege to gather together as a community. And we lift things all up to you, Lord. And we pray these in your wonderful name. And all God's people said, amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being part of Frontline Church, whether you happen to be in seat here or you happen to be joining us online this morning. I may be sitting at a soggy campground or just like at a cottage with the rain coming down, but hey, you're here together regardless if you're in the building or not. And so we thank you for that. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for being a co-laborer in the work here that takes place at Frontline. Uh, we have just a number of opportunities for us to continue to partner together, continue to labor together. Uh, we have something happening in August here, which is actually our Scent Blitz event here, where we have an opportunity to partner with three of our local partnerships, one being the storehouse on the far end of our building there, we have the essential store and then also hand to hand. And uh, there's just different opportunities for you to lean in and to partner with us. And if you scan with your phone that QR code there, you're just going to see a bunch of different opportunities. Uh, otherwise, just go online there. But here's a perfect thing. It's 
August uh, coming up here, and it's getting towards the end of summer, and maybe you're thinking, man, we haven't really done anything as a family together. This is a great opportunity to serve as a family, packing food for kids uh, to go back to school, helping sort things in our storehouse, or even helping out with uh, people in need in our essential store. So those are just opportunities for you. Uh, again, go online there, or there's going to be somebody in the back here, if you happen to be in service, who would love to answer your questions right over by the connection booth. So not only do we partner that way, but we partner with families to invest lifelong faith in our, in our kids. And so uh, we're doing that through child dedication. That's happening in August 28th. And maybe you have a child who uh, you haven't had uh, dedicated yet. Man, we would love the privilege of being able to dedicate your child to the Lord. So uh, again, scan with a QR code or do that. Our pastor, children's pastor, Amanda, would love to talk to you and just figure out the logistics of that. But thank you again just for being part of our church. And thank you for co-laboring there. Now, we have the opportunity right now to give back uh, to the Lord. And again, that's not just done individually. Uh, that's done corporately. So we get to do that together. And so... As one of the people that has the privilege of kind of helping out with the finances, can I just say thank you? Can I just say really thank you so much? You have blessed this church immeasurably over the summer months here, and we are just grateful. Uh, we can't do things like the essential store and the storehouse or hand-to-hand -hand or even just even have a service on this without your faithful giving. So thank you so much for how you give. So there's different ways to give on, uh, you'll see on the screen here, but uh, again, just, uh, just a privilege to be able to serve in a community where people are so vested. So I would love to pray for our offering, and then David is going to come up and, uh, and just teach this morning. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, again, just uh, thank you so much for just being our God. Thank you for the privilege of magnifying your name this morning. Um, even in just learning a new song and just hearing people just lean into that, Lord, just to magnify your name. So thank you for that. Thank you for our team here, Lord, that you have just placed at Frontline. I just think of all the different individuals. We had Spring Hill Camp here this past week, and uh, just uh, our children's pastor and our children's team. And you're going to hear more about that in a little bit, <laughs> but thank you, Lord, for how you just, uh, man, just worked in so many different people's lives. Thank you for worship here. Thank you for uh, just our teaching team and just missions, everything that's just going on here at church. And thank you for these people, Lord, that have given so faithfully to you. Um, so I thank you for that. I pray for David right now, Lord, just a, a blessing on him as he uh, comes to speak this morning. Uh, you know how much I love that guy, and I just, I just am so blessed to be able to co-labor with him. And so thank you for his heart, and thank you, Lord, for the preparation that he uh, put into place for this morning, and just ask, Lord, that that would come out as an outpouring of his relationship with you uh, would be the outpouring of what he speaks today. So I pray this in your name. Amen. for? That's the question I want to tackle and unpack today. I think every day we all wake up and we have to ask and answer this particular question. Who am I here for? Who am I here for in this world? Who am I here for in this life? Who am I here for in my family or in my workplace or in my school or in my neighborhood or in my church? Who am I here for? I think the people that have the largest impact on our world answer that question so clearly and so specifically. They know exactly who they are here to serve, but too often we serve a what rather than a who. Let me read uh, an excerpt from a book. It's called Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek, and it says this. He says, the true price of leadership is the willingness to place the needs of others above your own. Great leaders truly care about those that they are privileged to lead, and they understand that the true cost of leadership privilege comes at the expense of self-interest. What he's saying is true leaders, the best leaders, the leaders we look up to, 
the leaders we admire, the leaders in our family, the leaders in our government, the leaders in our churches, the leaders all around the world, the leaders that we look up to are those that serve a who, not a what. What do I mean by that? Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. I just thought these were fun. Uh, The difference of serving a who versus a what is people showing up to work for their customers rather than just a paycheck. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe you work with some of these people. It's like, you're just here for the money, aren't you? You're not here for the people or the customers or or those that we exist to make an impact on. Uh, Maybe this one. I don't hope to get too close to this one, but enough to poke the bear. Maybe politicians that run for office for a position of power rather than those who serve. Does that hit both sides equally enough? That's what I was hoping for. Hook, jab. Uh, What about this one? Uh, People who donate money to a nonprofit for a tax write-off rather than the impact that it could have on people. I think every day we are forced to answer this question, who am I here for? When we serve a what, the who is us. When we serve a specific need or a specific thing that we want to see happen, chances are it's gonna come back around to us unless we can identify someone else that we actually exist to serve. A couple months ago, uh, you know, I got up here and we were talking about Spring Hill that was coming up. So a church of our size, I mean, we, we were excited to have a gigantic Spring Hill week. And because Spring Hill, a camp, uh, it's a day camp that bounces church to church to church. They actually set a cap for us of 100 kids. So we had no control over this. They've had staffing issues. But we had Spring Hill come in last week. What you would never know is three weeks ago, Spring Hill sent us an email and they said, we're not sure we have enough staff to come to your church. So either we lower the amount of kids or we cancel Spring Hill altogether. And so we said, no way. We, we went before many of you and we just said, hey, I know maybe serving in this capacity isn't your jam. It's not what you'd want to do. It's not what you, you seem fun or, or would like to maybe do. But, but what we asked you is to maybe change vacation schedules or take off time at work or reorient your family life or what, whatever it is to come and serve so that we could actually reach our community. And here's what I'm so excited to tell you is this last week, we had a cap of 100, so many volunteers here at our church that served for check-in volunteers, served as CITs, which is counselors in training, served as counselors, shepherds, cleanup crew, prayer team, host homes, lunch prep. We had 66 volunteers from our church that stepped up and said, I want to serve. 66. Here's what that translated to. Spring Hill, when we were capped at 100, we were able to clear our entire waiting list. We had 128 kids, many of whom were from our community, that actually got to come in this last week and get to know the person of Jesus on a level that's designed and fit for them. So if that was you, if you're one of those that served, we just want to say thank you on behalf of the church. We're just so grateful for your willingness to serve and to make an impact. But here's what I love about this that I want to make sure we capture. We just sent our community a message. And the message is this. We're here for you. We're here for you. We're here to serve for you. This is what we're talking about today. We're in this series right now called Soul Work, and it's a a focus through all of the different spiritual disciplines. There's inner disciplines, there's outward disciplines, and then there's corporate disciplines. And so today, uh, the discipline we're talking about, as you've probably guessed already, is service. And service demands that we answer the question, who is it that we are actually here to serve? If we don't do this, though, we actually have the chance of missing something so significant, so important, something so vital to following Jesus. And that's why we have to spend an entire day talking about service. Because I know many of you, I know your schedules, I know your lives, I know your families, I know that you are busy, Can I get an amen from anybody on that? We are busy, right? We are a busy people. We're a busy culture and a busy country. I have a three and a half year old and a seven month old who just started crawling. We are busy people all the time, right? Do any of you have kids that don't like coordinating nap times or time off or good moods or bad moods, anything like that? That's, we're busy, right? We're a culture, we're families, we're people who are busy. So here's what would be easy for all of us to do today. You've already heard, I'm going to talk about service. What would be easy for us to do is to write it off and say, I'm too busy right now. I'll do that later. 
I'm too busy to do that. I'm too busy to serve. I'm too busy to do something for other people. We are too busy as a family with sports schedules or doctor's appointments or, or fun things or vacations. We are too busy to serve. But what if I told you we actually might make a grave mistake, and the mistake would be this, that we would subconsciously begin to believe that life revolves around us, that everything around us exists to serve us, which is exactly the opposite message that Jesus shared and taught and proclaimed to his disciples and to his followers. So today we need to talk about service because it matters. So if we're going to summarize it, here's how I would summarize it. I would say this, the discipline of service is about a who, not a what. If you're going to write anything down, if you're going to capture anything, capture this statement. The discipline of service is not about a what. It's about a who. It's about a who. It's about a person. It's about people. So to do that, we're going to dive in. We're going to be in Philippians. So if you turn your Bible, or if you open it up, or if you just look at the screen, Philippians chapter 2, Paul is writing to a group living in Greece, right, or around Greece at the time, and he says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of of others. Paul is writing this, and what you need to know is that if that kind of rubs you the wrong way, or if you're like, no, that feels, feels unwise, feels like I should focus on me, get me first, right? That's what they say in the airplanes, right? Take care of you first, then the people around you. It's, doesn't it make sense to do that in life? But what Paul is saying is no. Actually, demote yourself, humble yourself, reduce yourself, and elevate the people around you, whether they're believers and have a relationship with Jesus or not, whether you're family members or your friends or you're tight relationally or not. What Paul is encouraging the church to do is to humble themselves to serve the people around them. The culture at this time, the Greek culture, that was antithetical to it. It was paradoxical. It, what they said was exactly the opposite. Let me read what one of the scholars says. He, he writes this. They believed the lowliness of mind was a fault, not a virtue. That if you actually humbled yourself, if you did what Paul was talking about, that is a fault of yours. It's a character flaw. Here, here's what one of their authors wrote. They said the pagan and the secular idea of manhood is self-assertiveness, imposing one's will on others. When anyone stooped to others, he did so only under compulsion. Hence, his actions were deemed disgraceful. What Paul was writing to the church to do was disgraceful to the community and the society in which they lived. The society says, focus on you. Focus on the self. Focus on the individual. Focus on you and what you want and your desires. Don't ever stoop down to somebody else's level. Paul said, wrong. We exist to serve. If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, we exist to serve other people. It's so important that we get this right. He says a couple things in here. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Not all ambition is selfish. Right, a lot of times uh, ambition starts very pure, starts very focused. It's focused on other people, even if it's your own family, even if it's your kids, even if it's a, an impact that you want to make on a community or on a society. Oftentimes ambition starts pure, but over time when we start re reaping the benefits of work or drive or ambition, we get other things like promotions, recognition, financial incentive, independence, freedom. We, we start to get these other things, and if we're not careful over time, if we don't make an intentional effort to serve the people around us, all of the things that come with an ambition begin to sway selfishly. We begin to start seeing the people around us as they work for us. We, we begin to see our kids or our family members as they exist to do something for me. 
We begin to see our finances or our possessions or our influence in this world as these things exist for me, not for other people. And it's a grave, grave danger. So Paul says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition. And then he says, or vain conceit. If I, uh, if I transliterate this or if I, if I translate it so literally, the actual words that are used for vain conceit is empty glory. He's saying, don't, don't pursue the shallow result. Don't pursue the shallow praise or the shallow recognition or, or the thing that doesn't actually make an impact on those around. Don't pursue the empty glory. But then it says this, in humility, value others above yourselves. Why is this so important? Why do we have to get this right? Because it sends a message. And the message is the answer to the question, who are you here for? If we don't serve other people, the message we unknowingly send to our spouse, to our kids, to our workplaces, our bosses, our employees, our coworkers, the message we send is I'm here for me. That's who I'm here for. But when we get this right, when we say I'm here for others, it actually maybe even unintentionally points to the person of Jesus. So let's keep reading this. Verse five, it says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself, say this word with me, nothing. Come on, say it with conviction. He made himself nothing. nothing. That just rubs me the wrong way. I mean, Paul's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's talking about the one who can raise people from the dead, who can perform miracles, who, who can do anything, who is over all things. Paul is talking about that person, that Jesus. He's talking about him, and he's saying, Jesus willingly demoted himself, reduced himself, gave it all up, and became not just less. Paul says became nothing. That is so counterintuitive to the natural human drive. I bet every person in this room, I bet every person watching online or listening later has this drive, I want to be something. I want to be something to somebody. I want to make an impact somewhere for something or some, somebody or, or something important. I, I want to be somebody. Jesus, who had everything, who was everything, reduced himself to the point of being Nothing. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. This word, if you translate this word, it actually means bond servant or slave. Jesus so reduced himself, he so humbled himself, he made himself nothing. Being made in human likeness. Let's go to the next slide. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. You might say, well, well, Jesus reduced himself to death, but he knew he was gonna resurrect. Jesus became nothing for us. It wasn't to get something from us. It was to do something for us. Something we, we couldn't even do ourselves. Jesus reduced himself for our benefit. He literally served us. Because he was so moved by us. He was so moved by you. Even in your pain, even in your brokenness, even in your shame or your guilt or your sin, Jesus was so moved, he demonstrated his love for us by serving us, by laying it all down. I catch this, the, the first who that we exist to serve is Jesus. As we talk about service, it's not just about those that are outside, just, not just those who don't have a relationship with Jesus, not just those in your family. The first who that we exist to serve is the person of Jesus, but it is as we serve him that we are to become like him and model that to the people around us. Jesus demonstrated it for us. He actually laid the groundwork for us. And he said, if you want to serve our world, if you want to make an impact on our world, if you want to change things for eternity, do like I do. And serve. 
give up everything for the sake of someone who can't repay you. One of the jobs I had um, not too long ago, I, I, it was actually before Frontline, I was on staff at a church and I needed hours. Uh, I, back then, not everybody was hiring. You remember that time, right? When not everybody was short staffed. So I was at a church, we were not uh, short staffed, but we had a position that was opening up. I was a resident there. So I was learning about how to be a pastor and how to preach and how to teach and how to counsel and, and how to do all the other pastoral things. So I was learning, uh, but pretty part-time. And so they had this position opened up and I was like, nice, I don't care what it is. I need hours, I'm ready to go. And the position that they hired me on for, uh, on top of it, was a custodian. And so I, I want you to hear this. Uh, hear this as like a, a young, a young motivated guy that's trying to, to drive and produce and prove and all that. I mean, I, I was in a, a master's degree program. It's a 96 credit master's degree. And the job that I was able to secure at the church was a custodian. So I didn't come in with the best attitude, okay? Are you tracking with me? Any of you know a young person maybe like that? It's like I, I needed an attitude adjustment. I came in and uh, what I had to do was clean the preschool. That job sucks, okay? <laughs> Let me acknowledge that. That's a horrible job, particularly uh, because they have a bathroom. So if you've ever seen a preschool or attempt to go to the bathroom, like if you've raised one, you're like, this is, this is a messy job. Multiply that by like 30 and then reduce the parental oversight. It's like when you walk into that bathroom, you're like a tornado went through here, but it was like it went through a porta potty and then it just left the remains. That's what I had to come in every single day and clean up. Over and over, I mean, pulling toilet paper out and pulling trash cans out. And it's like, how the heck did this end up in the bathroom? I served over and over and over. And I, I had this thing that I, I just, I resented the job. I resented the job because of this. I said, I, I'm pursuing a master's degree. I'm too good for this. I don't need to be doing this. I don't need to be serving this. I'm just doing this for the money. That's all I'm doing. My, I had a boss who had been in facilities at this church for 40 years been the facility manager. He'd done it so well. He was my boss. He was my leader. He was my coach. And so the longer I spent with him, he used to have this phrase to me that actually changed my entire life. The phrase he would say over and over and over is this, David, our ministry is we clean up after a long day of ministry in preparation for another day of ministry. That's what we're called to. I wish I could tell you it just changed my whole perspective overnight and I went, oh, I just start prancing around in the bathroom going, this is great, I love this job, I love, I didn't. What happened was over time, the more I served, the more I ground, the more I did the dirty stuff and the more I scrubbed poop, the more I did all of this nastiness, the more I actually started falling in love with those I was serving. Because I would walk into a preschool and I would see the remnants of kids learning and understand, understanding about Jesus for the very first time. I could tell when a day was a good day because there was mess everywhere. I, I could go throughout the rest of our church and I would clean up and I, I would understand that ministry had taken place in a counseling room when the trash can was full of Kleenex. As I went from classroom to classroom, I'd erase the whiteboards and I would see how people were, were growing and learning and changing, whether it was for marriage, whether it was for personal, whether it was growing new leaders for the sake of the gospel. Here's the whole thing. Everything changed for me in serving when I served for the who rather than the what. All of a sudden, I was understanding the true call of ministry better than I had in my other half of the job. I, I, let me say this differently. If you don't serve for a who, if you're serving for a what, if you're what's a paycheck, if you're what's a promotion, if it's recognition, if it's, if it's something that serves you, you're not serving a who, you're serving you. And for the first time, it was in this facilities job, I'm so grateful for it to this day, I learned there's no job I'm above. Not one. Because Jesus modeled it Jesus got on his hands and knees. Jesus served the people around him, not even because he had to, because he wanted to, because he was so moved by them and by us. When I started serving the who, it changed my entire heart. So as Paul says, you know, become like Jesus or model your life after him, or even uh, here's the exact word he says, has, have the same mindset as Jesus. Let's go to a passage of scripture that demonstrates the mindset of Jesus. John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. 
Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, catch that, having loved his own, having loved the people, not obligatory, not because he was forced to, not because he was annoyed by them or frustrated by them, because he loved them. But having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Let me set the scene. All the disciples are in the upper room. They're sitting around the table. There was a job in this culture that it always went to the least person in the room. It went to the slave or it went to the servant or it went to the, to the person, the youngest maybe. It always went to the person who, who was farthest away from the most elite in the room. Their job was to go to each person and wash their feet. Now, that might be gross in our context, right? We wear socks and shoes or whatever. In their context, their plumbing was horrible. One might say it stunk. It would leak everywhere. It would leak under the streets. It would leak uh, even outside houses and in alleyways. So as people walked, whether they wore shoes or not, their feet over time became caked with, you know what I'm talking about. So imagine the room and imagine the smell that you might smell in the room. And all of the disciples are looking at one another. They've followed Jesus now for three years. And they're all looking at each other and they're all playing this silent game that you and I play in different contexts. The game is this, it ain't my job. I will wait. I will outwait you. I will wait right here. It's right here and ready for you, dude. You know, and all the disciples, right, especially a bunch of young guys looking at each other like, there's no way I'm touching your feet. Oh, yes, you are. I'm older than you. You know, it's like they're playing this game. Jesus senses it in the room. Nobody's moving. Everybody knows the job that needs to be done. Nobody moves, and then Jesus does something. Here's what Jesus does. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus knew, I'm the greatest one in the room. Jesus knew. Guess what? Everybody knew. Everybody in that room knew. We, we can fight over whose job it might be, but everybody agreed it's not Jesus's. Here's what happened. He knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. How do you feel if you're one of the disciples in the room right now? You're like, I knew I should have gotten up and just did it. I could have held it against the other guys forever, but now it's awkward. Now it's uncomfortable. Now it's like, oh man, you're the one guy that we all agreed didn't have to do this. And Jesus goes, okay, you're next. Stick out your feet. And you look down and you're like, that's disgusting. And you stick your foot out and Jesus washes yours. And it takes a while because he's got to scrub it. He's got to floss it. He's, he's got to dig it all out. And then he does the next one and the next one and the next one. You see how it's like, that's disgusting. Jesus did it for a bunch of teenage and 20-something-year-old men. Gross. Does the entire room, and you can imagine, it's silent. Jesus does every single one of them. Think about how uncomfortable it would be. I mean, just for a second. How awkward, how uncomfortable, maybe even shameful, embarrassing Gross, Jesus got down on his hands and knees and he washed everybody's feet and the text even tells us, even Judas. Jesus already knew he was going to turn on him. That 24 hours later, Jesus would be hanging on a cross because of the guy that he was looking in the eyes, washing his feet. And yet he served him. Not too long ago, I was on social media and I, I discovered these images uh, that started to move me. I mean, I just, it captured me. And often these images came out when something significant or something polarizing was going on in our world or in our country. And I wanted to show them to you. It's called salt and gold. They're images of Jesus washing different groups of people's feet. So this one, the juxtaposition is he's washing the feet of an inmate, and then the one right after, he was washing the feet of a police officer. 
He's watching both sides, both groups. The next one here, this one came out not too long ago. This was Roe versus Wade. It shows Jesus washing the feet of a pro-lifer versus a pro-choicer. Doesn't matter who they are, Jesus gets down on his knees and he begins washing and scrubbing regardless of who it was. Then it goes on to the next one. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat, whether you voted for Trump or Biden or third party, that Jesus gets on his knees and washes the feet of all of them. Or this last one, whether it's Ukraine or Russia, whether it's the LGBT community, whether it's the orphans, those that are sick and dying, whether it's the nurses, it, you fill in the blank, whatever it might be. I hope what this does in you is the same thing that it does in me. It reminds me that Jesus didn't come just to serve me. He came to serve all of us regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of our social status, regardless of our belief system, regardless of which side of a war we're on, regardless of everything, Jesus actually got down on his knees and he looks us in the eyes and he serves us. Why would he do that? Because it sends us a message and the message is this, I'm here for you because I love you, because I care about you, because I see you, and I see your woundedness, I see your pain, I see your brokenness, I see your sin, I see everything that separates you and me, and yet I'm going to serve you so that the message you receive is that I love you. This is the message we are called to communicate as a church. Over the last couple months, I've met with a lot of people, uh, even here at Frontline, many of them, uh, I would say, don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe not yet. And, and I ask, like, what, what's it like being you? What do you feel like when you come to our church? What are you afraid of? What, what, what are you apprehensive about? What, what would make you feel comfortable? What makes you feel uncomfortable? People, people who come into church or give, give church a, a shot or, or just give it a once over, like, eh, I'll, I'll try it. Here's what a lot of people come in here thinking or feeling about us. Many people perceive Christians as homophobic, racist, elitist, ethnocentric, closed-minded, hypocritical, judgmental, rude, dominating, and fake. That hurts, doesn't it? Well, here's why this moves me. That's not who Jesus is. I heard a pastor say this once. I just, I kept it with me ever since. He said, you know, people who are nothing like Jesus loved him. People on the other side of the aisle People on the other side of the spectrum, other side of the political world, other side of everything, the people who had nothing in common with Jesus loved him. They couldn't get enough of him. Yet the people who had an issue with him were church people. You guys, we're called to demonstrate to our community and to our world, this is who Jesus is. And we get to model it by the way that we serve by the way we give, by the way we volunteer, by the way we sacrifice, by putting our hands up and saying that's the nastiest job and nobody in our community, nobody in our business, nobody in our family, nobody in our neighborhood is willing to do it, but I will. Well, why? Because I'm a Jesus follower and because that's what he did for me. There's nothing that I am above. Because Jesus, who was above everything, reduced himself to nothing. Therefore, if I'm going to follow him, I will do the exact same thing. It sends our world a message that says, I'm here for you because Jesus is too. So this is what we're called to as a church, and it's what he's called us to do. So here's what I would say. Uh, I'm biased. I love our church. I love this church so much. I think you have one of the best opportunities to serve right here at Frontline. And the reason I think that is because our team, our staff, our leaders, our volunteers, we actually go out into the community, we go build relationships, and we bring many of some of the best opportunities for you to serve, we bring them here. 
So our, our August serve blitz, you may have written that off 30 minutes ago. I'm gonna ask you, please reconsider. Please serve with your family. Please serve with your spouse. Please serve with your small group or with your neighborhood, but don't come in and serve the what. Don't come in and just serve product. Don't come in and just serve food. Come in and serve people. I mean, if I, if I put this slide back up here, our essential store actually serves people who have significant financial and physical need right here in Grand Rapids. These are people that need things like toilet paper and shampoo and toothpaste and toothbrushes and deodorant, diapers, many of which aren't covered under WIC. They actually come to us. Last year, we served 212 individual families, and it's 105 families every single month that are coming in. If you say, that group moves me, would you come and serve in our central store? Just come try it in August. What, what about this one? I mean, hand-to-hand. Hand-to-hand serves a vulnerable population here in Grand Rapids, uh, partnering schools with churches to feed kids who don't have enough food on the weekends. So what we do is we collect food, we donate food, we buy food, we pack it, we put it in little backpacks, and we drop it off at the schools so that kids can go home and they don't have to worry about if they're going to eat that weekend or not. If you say, that moves me, man, would you serve in hand to hand, our storehouse is a third of our building over here. Uh, in two weeks, over the last month, in a two week period, they turned down $40 million worth of product. Product that they couldn't take in because they can't move it fast enough. And what they do is they redistribute it to organizations and nonprofits and churches who are trying to meet the needs of people on a personal basis in our community. They take those in and then we get to volunteer and help sort it help move it, help load it on a truck, meet people, meet the organizations that are serving hand, hand to hand with all of these. If they move you, which I hope they do, would you just serve at one of them? If nothing else for the message that it sends our community, which is we're here for you because Jesus is too. As I close, I know band's gonna start here. Uh, this last week, I talked to you about Spring Hill. I was talking to a gentleman. He's just become a dear friend of mine at the church over the last couple of years. Uh, I asked him for permission to share this story and he said, yes, his name's Jim. And so we, I made a pitch a few months ago and I said, Spring Hill, we need volunteers ASAP. Like we need a please rearrange your schedule, change vacation, take time off, whatever. And so he, he was one of them. And he showed up and, and this morning even he said to me and he goes, David, I thought I was too old to do this. And he goes, and then I did it and I was right. <laughs> <laughs> here's, what, here's what I watched him do all week. I mean, it, to give you a, a, an idea of like how exhaustive this was, uh, we had like 15 CITs, counselors in training. These are like high schoolers. Uh, they were in bed at 6 p.m. during camp weeknights. And so Jim, I'm talking to Jim, and, and the story that unfolded with Jim is um, we had a, a special needs student here as part of camp from our community. He doesn't go here to Frontline. So he needed a buddy. That's what Spring Hill provides. And so we had a volunteer here who was a 17 year old woman who was his buddy for the week. She just helped take care of him, help make sure he didn't get overwhelmed, provide for his needs. Well, there was one day um, that it, it became too much and he, he started freaking out. Loud outbursts started scaring some other people. A lot of people backed off and he started taking clothes off. And, and it was like this 17 year old girl was just amazing. She couldn't, she couldn't get him under control. And Jim happened to be walking by. And Jim had met him earlier and he said, we had made contact earlier and he, and he trusted me. And so Jim walks right up to him in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of freaking out, in the midst of taking clothes off, Jim walks right up to him and he grabs his head and he said, look at me, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. And he just held him there. He just held him. And what everybody around him said is, is the emotions, the anxiety, the chaos, the fear in this child dissipated. And he brought him right back down. He just prayed over him. Prayed with him. Restored the peace. Starting first with his mind, Jim's exact words to me this morning was, David, I was here for him. He was here for a who. Who are you here for? As you leave this place today, as you go back to your family, as you go back to your workplace, as you go back to your neighborhood, who are you here for? Would you point people to your heavenly father? who just loves you like crazy, who gave us the message through his son that he said, I love you so much, I'm here for you. 
And Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross to demonstrate that he'd do anything for us. Let's be that same witness to our community. Would you pray with me? God, we just come before you right now. We just pray that you would work, that you would move, that you would stir in us even just a hunger and a desire and a longing to demonstrate you. So we pray, Father, for opportunities uh, to serve, to serve people that are different than us, to serve a demographic that is different than us, uh, to serve in a different context than us, to serve outside of our comfort zones. God, I just pray that the things that we hold on to that we don't want to let go of, that we would release those so that we might be a representation of you that we would take on the inconvenience, we'd take on the pain, we'd take on the shame, that there'd be nothing above us since you set the bar. So use us, God, use our church, use our people to bless this world, to bless our community, to bless Grand Rapids, to bless people that don't know you. God, we just pray that you would put yourself on display through the way that we love and serve other people. And we pray this right now in Jesus' name and all God's people said together, Amen. amen. this morning, would you stand? Just worship with us. It is our desire that the Holy Spirit would awaken us, awaken Frontline, awaken this city, Grand Rapids. So let's just, let's be sent out in this way this morning. Come awaken your people.
So as we close this morning, um, if you're new, thank you so much for joining us. You can go out uh, past these barn doors to the Next Steps area, and we'll have someone there to greet you and just welcome you. If you're online, frontlinegr.com forward slash new. We'd love to connect with you. And before we leave today, I would love if we could just pray together and seal this time. There's going to be a prayer on the screen. That last line, we'll say that together. Um, so would you just extend your hands in a posture of reception? Almighty God, grant that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring spiritual revival to our world and let your gospel message go forth like never before. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to serve Christ by serving all and help us to love one another as you love us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So it is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we send you out to serve those that are around you. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day.